Hey everybody, I'm Sean Robinson. I'm Carson Grubaugh. Welcome to Living the Line. And who's this? And today we're here. Yeah, who is that? Is that Brandon Graham? How you doing, oh, Brandon? Hey guys, I didn't see you there. <laughs> He's too busy looking at Butt Man. <laughs> you're in the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even started, Carson. You're already on the Butt Man. I, I was going to make a Wendy, uh, uh, our, our lady and patroness of the arts, Wendy Peeney, is also visiting us uh, today. So, Brandon, you brought Wendy oh, out. Sure. Oh. Wendy, you to love or, hey, keep, sorry, well, hold on a second. I just dropped the picture. And this is what I have hung above my desk. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Wendy Peeney was under the desk, which was a bit Wendy odd. <laughs> no, an inspiration in so many different ways. Uh, uh, Wendy, Wendy Peeney, um, both as a cartoonist, cosplayist, uh, and uh, Frank Thorne acolyte. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Totem of the conversation. And uh, uh, speaking of dress up, it is almost Halloween, and we are probably going to try to get this in front of Halloween, uh, because we are talking about a scary, spooky story. Uh, today, actually, a uh, short story collection by a uh, Japanese artist who wants to give uh, a shot. Is it Daisuke Daisuke, Daisuke Igarashi. Igarashi? Yeah, Daisuke Igarashi. That's good. Yeah, um, which uh, you guys have, have you guys ever read Children of the Sea? I think that's probably his best known work in English. Yeah, I have. Um, no, I just ordered all five volumes last night, though, after I reread Witches and was like, damn, I better get this now because it looks like it's out of print now and oh. prices are going up. I have several volumes that I've read out of order, but it's I it, it was interesting to read short stories of his because they're so um, like I think of his stuff as kind of uh, almost amorphous and because he's really good. He's really good at drawing weather. Like he's the only artist I can think mm -hmm. of that does really focuses on weather and environments in this in the way that he does and so it was you know and and children of the sea is you know five giant fat volumes that kind of meanders a lot and there's lots of swimming with whales and things so having shorter tighter stories i got a better sense of him as a cartoonist mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's interesting you're calling him tighter because they, even in uh, even in the sort of like limited uh, scope they have a sort of meandering quality to them especially i'd say like the first one uh, yeah. but yeah this is this is a 2012 uh, this came out in 2012 right because we've been talking about this since last fall i think mm -hmm. uh, and uh, came out from the english edition came out from 7c uh 7c's which did a i think a really good job of uh adapting the text and also interesting to see you know when people take the plunge and actually replace all of japanese sound effects and everything and uh, i thought they did a really good job uh with it um maybe we should just kind of go straight for the flip through if you guys are up for it yeah for sure i know youtube videos people people stick around for a little bit and then leave but something that really cool about the witches trade is at least in my opinion the stories get better and better and my favorite story is the final one fantastic yeah, I mean, and these are presumably chronological order, huh? I mean, it looks like stylistically, like uh, these were these were probably produced in the order that they are in the in the book. Well, it it seems like because he on the contents. First off, just shout out this amazing like kind of Celtic lettering in the in the to kind of title page there. But yeah, in the contents, he says arc one, two, three, and four. So that seems to imply to me that he's thinking about these as pieces of a whole. And I don't know if they came out chronologically, but they're definitely arranged in a very purposeful order. Yeah, and each of these uh, stories uh, t tackles a different aspect of witchcraft or uh, magic in general in a different locale. And so these are fair. This is a fairly international book, which I think is uh, pretty apropos for his art style. Uh, Daisuke Igarashi is sort of working in that. I mean, it, I mean, I, I call it an international style. I guess it's a fairly lazy uh, thing for me to say, but. Uh, like when we were talking to Linnea Sturt, um, I, I was I was telling Linnea that I thought that she was one of those international artists, like you know, like uh, Matsumoto, like Taiyo Matsumoto, mm -hmm. somebody who's like absorb and Brandon, frankly, uh, somebody who's absorbed influences from many different continents and many different like uh, you know styles and sort of successfully put them together. I mean, I think you see that just on the first few pages here. Yeah, you can see that relation to Linnea Sturt's work as well with that kind of 
broken stuttery line that's like half Moebius, half Miyazaki. Right. And she's accomplishing that with a pencil generally, but this is, I mean, you yeah, know, I know she does pen and ink work that has a similar kind of quality to it. But yeah, Miyazaki is another person like that. I mean, he, you know, he doesn't read Japanese all the time, especially if you look like his environmental drawings and things like that. He seems like yeah. he's firmly in that international camp there. Yeah, so, so this stuff almost reads to me more like it, it feels more tied to uh, like sketchbook life drawing than a lot of comic art I've seen. Like even mm -hmm. the thread that, that Carson has up here, it looks like somebody went out and drew from reality or from a photo more than it looks like. Uh, like the, it, it feels like it's less kind of buried under a style. Yeah, it, it does. It seems very responsive. And I like that in his figure work as well. His figure work has like a looseness to it. And there are definitely some scenes where like anatomy or the faces get distorted, but it gives like a better sense of motion throughout because yeah like this face right here uh it just looks kind of weird and distorted but in this whole scene of the bazaar here it does look like it's drawn at the speed of trying to capture people as they move and any of the distortions are kind of give it that sense of yeah like i i looked up three seconds later and their face turned a little bit and i just put that into the drawing so screw it and it, it really works really really well a freshness to all the line work, even when something is referenced uh, really heavily. So yeah, obviously this one, this uh, story takes place in uh, uh, like Constantinople uh, or somewhere in Turkey. Uh, did you get a bead on the actual city that they're in? Uh, I, I guess that's not really 100% uh, certain. I, I was wondering if anyone knew, because this is obviously a very specific city, and they, they talk about it here as a uh, very melting pot type of uh, influences. You know, there's they're talking about yeah. the 12 apostles, the goddess of love, like all these different myths that have impacted this one city. Yeah, I would I mean, I would I would bet that it's, uh, you know, Istanbul, um, but but uh, they don't just come right out and say it. So it's obviously in Turkey. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can see the settings for it, but basically like there's a magical event happening above, uh, or sorry, uh, well, we, we'll learn that till later in the story, but a magical event uh, happening at the scene of a bazaar and yeah. uh, this woman who has, you know, has some type of obviously derangement is uh, attempting to revenge herself uh, and get some type of plot going uh, on revenge herself upon the owners or organizers of the bazaar. And you gradually sort of get the idea that there's something happening underneath the bazaar that she wants access to. And and she talks about Constantine being buried under there. So I yeah. think um, it's got Istanbul, yeah. Istanbul, yeah, is pretty good. Because it would be Constantinople, right? Isn't that the... Yeah, yeah. right. The song, yeah. <laughs> And this this kind of drawing here has that thing that Brandon's talking about where you're you're underneath the bazaar in the catacombs. It has that sketch look to it, but it never feels like him being sloppy either, which is really impressive to me. Yeah, that's, that's one of the ones where I was like, what in the hell is happening like with the actual mark making? Uh, I mean, that's got to be dry brush there, right? Like uh, it, it's kind of hard to see there this, you know we've got like a light tone on top of it but so you gotta um, you gotta start over when your cameras oh, sorry <laughs> start that over <laughs> that that's one of those panels that i actually was like what in the world is actually happening in the line work uh because that particular panel looks like almost like he went and scribbled it in gesturally with a micron and then did dry brush on top of it before the tone is applied is that is that what you guys are seeing there uh, to me, I just see the scribbling. I don't see any dry brush, really. Interesting. Maybe some of that is just back and forth uh, scribble passes over the, you know, overlapping scribble passes then. Yeah, I think uh, if Brandon has the time, me and Brandon are going to do a reaction to the Monvin video of this guy drawing. And if I remember correct from when I watched it, he uses just like a rollerball, like ballpoint pen <laughs> type of rollerball <laughs> pen. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean that could explain some of the the, the, the scritchiness then because you're yeah you're, you're not necessarily going to pick up every little nuance. The the very next page after that I think gives a pretty good idea of you know 
his like story beats in a lot of these where he'll he'll have a bunch of you know events and then pull back for one like impactful like single page or double page spread and uh, really different. like some really amazing uh monstrous designs and i i can see that linnea start again in in again the mark making and the kind of fantastical stuff where here uh she the witch the main witch is getting revenge on the the man who snubbed her love by having someone else turn his son into water basically this other girl's turning him into water and seeing the body here turn into water and all these distortions i mean it goes from that really really like well observed like brandon said in the situation getting the atmosphere and all of that to these fantastical things with no jumps you know in ability or style and that uh, that to be able to combine those kind of present with the fantastical is i think really impactful in his work yeah there's the the hemingway quote where he always talks about first start with something true that i always reference in in doing using reference you know looking at photographs or drawing from reality and there is a thing in this where where it feels like when he does something fantastical it, it carries over that realism that his just city streets that he was clearly looking at a photograph or going to the place have like when he's drawing these like flying demon birds on the left hand page you just passed like there it feels like there's a reality behind them it almost and it, it like it's definitely a manga it has this like japanese pacing to it but there's a like a connection to film i think and sketchbook stuff and, and a lot of how things are portrayed yeah and and dense dense atmosphere like as these birds come in and pack up black there i mean it's just so saturated in that kind of thing uh the other, other another thing i like talking about him as a fantastical artist is that a lot of times when he he has these battles between forces like they're battling with their magic powers he'll almost leave the characters out entirely and it just turns into abstractions which is something i really enjoy i've always hated when people try and talk about the mystical or things from another dimension or whatever and they still just look like people or like star trek characters or something it's like no i don't know like galactus if he's gonna eat planets like he wouldn't look like a person you know and so the this going into these more abstract moments for a mystical fight seems really appropriate to me yeah and there's and something he does in this story that i think he continues to do throughout the book where he takes two stories that feel completely disconnected in time and place and manages to have them converge by the end yeah that's... that was very uh the first time i read it i remember being confused in the first story and being like what the hell is this story about i was also kind of thinking about it as like going to be one long story or it sells itself as like an interconnected set of four stories which really is only a thematic connection on a second read because we've been talking about doing a video for this for a year and a half now i think since the book came out uh so i, I had to reread it uh it really made a lot more sense because i kind of knew what his storytelling style was and came in prepared for that like he'll go like oh 30 years ago and then back to now and then jumping back and forth across big spans of time and i think that's what you're saying like his a longer series he can meander a little bit more and yeah. this this forces him to pack those big jumps into a smaller amount of time. Yeah, like this one spend a certain amount of time like showing a little girl like way out in the country and she like the magic comes. It, a really interesting thing in the beginning of this is this little girl weaves a big um, tapestry and you see it after the tapestry is woven and she just says a bird came and landed on my head and I <laughs> my arms just moved by themselves and the tapestry was woven. And it's this really fantastical thing that I feel like most other artists would show, but she just kind of explains it like, it's, here's a thing that happened, mm -hmm. even though there's so much other fantastical stuff shown in the in the story. The disembodied um, nature of the final conflict there, it's interesting that you're picking that out because that definitely felt like more like a shoujo manga kind of technique mm -hmm. where a lot can't be contained anymore. And so you see a bunch of feathers flying everywhere or, you know what I mean? It's like a an embodiment of um, emotional reality through uh, like physical depiction. Mm -hmm. this is, yeah. And I, this I, is I think that's very powerful. Yeah. He does these, those, those loose abstracts stuff. then he has this thing here, which is almost like this 
um, artistic equivalent of like, um, it feels like a flourish. Like he's like, like if he, he just had the, the, the ab more abstract images without this level of weird detail, then I think it would feel le less um, concreted by the end. Like this compared to this. Yeah, like that feels like an artistic crescendo, I think is the best way to put it. Yeah, and like balancing, like here, they're really cool looking, but it is like a minimal amount of work technically versus this OCD, just absolutely beautiful set of sparkling stipple technique, uh, you know, with it, there's kind of like owls and birds all throughout here. I don't know how well that translates on screen, but um, it yeah, really does terrible. punch home the moment. <laughs> Yeah, and True secrets remain a secret forever. I was wondering if you guys had a pin on that particular image. That's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, I really like that idea. He he has all these ideas on, like he has this kind of magic lore throughout the book, and a lot of it feels like he's not giving us the answers for how magic works, and that's how magic works. Right. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I, I and, think... I think he does give answers, actually. Like, I don't remember picking that out in my first read, but in my second read, he at least gives you the things you need to do to get there. And yeah. I think in a, in a thing like this, he's showing you the overwhelming amount of information that you would be exposed to if you really opened your eyes and saw true secrets and, and that they could never be communicated fully because they're too... They're too robust. Uh, that's right. kind of what I get out of this. But he talks but about how to get there in later right. stories. Right. But he's talking about the catacombs, I think, in that story. Like, it's basically, it's a it's a bazaar in a city that is built upon uh, an ancient catacombs that had a, a powerful figure that was buried in them. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that's, like, trying to convey how much more is going beneath, like, literally beneath the surface with why the magic works and everything than what the, the individual characters even know and see. Yeah, totally. And I think thematically, to me, that's the core of the book, at least on last night's reading. <laughs> well, and, and, and this spread is as close as he gets in the in the book, I'd say, to uh, like performatively enacting a magical incantation. Uh, you can almost imagine somebody like drawing this in some kind of like penance or, uh, you know, trade like, you know, I'm going to depict this as best to my ability. And in turn, you'll bring my message to other people and sell me some books. You know what I mean? It's like oh, almost like uh, a, 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 a double page spread um, in, uh, in exchange for something like this is this is part of the, you know, this is the equivalent of the child weaver. And it's so dense that I just noticed there's a word balloon right here that says, yeah. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, it's it's G Y A A G H. Yeah. So like someone's <laughs> being trapped in there too. Um yeah, I mean it's it's really beautiful stuff and it it takes the graphomania to about as extreme of a level as you can go uh without without totally not being able to see anything. Um yeah, and it sets up, I think that sets up the thematics for the book. So if you go to the next story, then you're really getting more of a look at his uh, his philosophy about the world and his interest in nature and preserving nature and being in nature. Because this is a story about a witch trying to save the Amazon from being chopped down and they, they send in an army to shoot her, basically. And yeah. again, you get that sketchbook quality to the art where it's like, man, did you take a trip? It's too bad they didn't print these in color because they, they're real muddy and black and white with the, yeah. the wash on it. Um, but that real sense of like, did he go to the Amazon to draw this damn book? Like, like you got to be there to see something like that, right? It does. It definitely feels that way. This story, I thought, though, was was kind of the weakest in the book. Like it's it's a little like you get less of a sense of character and it has a lot of, and, and it kind of ends on a heavy handed note, I thought. <laughs> you think? <laughs> like the other stuff is very like, 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 especially the last story has this great, like kind of myth idea that brings in all this stuff. And this one mm -hmm. just basically like, they're destroying the Amazon and that's bad. And it has this, I and mean, we'll get to the, the last thing in here, I guess, but it's just like, 
Um, yeah, I was interested to see what you guys would think about that. The 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 first story, um, it was obvious to me that he's either a vegetarian or that's you know something that he's considered or part of his worldview because the the first story the the evil witch essentially you know has like a fixation about uh the heads of other things and she like buys every head in the bazaar um at some point and she's eating like a lamb's head and and savoring the flavor of the eyebrow uh, eyeballs and everything and the way that it's drawn and the way that she's like manipulating the person that's near her is clear to me that that's like part of the act is like the consuming of another you know being and i wasn't surprised to see that like philosophically worked into the story about the amazon too especially like you know they basically nuke this this witch is commandeered one part of the forest and is not going to move and these soldiers can't kill her um because of the the way that she's given herself to the forest spirits and so the 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 other spiritually aware but ready to be uh, ready to plow everything over guy basically sends in uh, helicopters to to shoot bombs and wipe out the entire area of the forest that she's living in um and they they plant cat you know they, they have cows grazing there afterwards instead um and uh, so it, it basically <laughs> converts this deep spiritual thing into like a hamburger yeah, and, and then the, the kids are eating like the ir- irradiated hamburger, basically. <laughs> yeah, it literally has the hand reaching out of the hamburger bun with like, please don't eat us. <laughs> <laughs> and then it has like a little short story, which is like an addendum to it, where I think it's her brother, like 30 years later, having tea. And they're talking about a, a witch riding on a bird because he has this as like part two of the story in the table of contents but it's a really strange little addendum but i thought um, that's that's the priest character who shows up in the in the next story i think as well the younger yeah priest. i think there's more relationships between these than there it seems at first i think there's more of a structure but before we move on from the story i want to point out that as cheesy it is he starts to give you some of the hint into his version of magic. And um, they, this character here says, well, the world isn't just made of light and heat. It has odors, tastes, and sounds too. And he advocates for that a lot in the fourth story uh, about really opening your senses to all of the input that your body is capable of. And I actually, like, that was so impactful on me last night um usually i wear earplugs when i go to sleep and i i said i'm gonna try and go to sleep without the earplugs in tonight and i'm gonna listen to everything i'm gonna feel my body against the bed i'm gonna feel the temperature uh and i think he's offering some very practical advice regarding the things that we don't see anymore as we've expanded our technological capabilities we're just not as in touch with the world around us and I think he's arguing that that's the gate to shamanism and magic and stuff. And that's pretty well summed up right there. Certainly. And then we get a space story. <laughs> and, and we should say that that's the, there's a, at least a, once in the book that's explicitly stated. Somebody says something along the lines of, I think it's the girl in the space story is told by her mother um, that you can't, you have to balance out your words and book learning with actual sensory experience and uh, and learning about your body uh, if, if you're expecting to to be a human being in the world. Yeah, I yeah. think I have that page tagged so we can, whenever I find that, we can read that directly. But this is another one that kind of takes a weird jump where you've got, like, you starting off in outer space and then you're jumping to like 12 months prior and you're in a village somewhere in I, i'm assuming somewhere nordic they've got uh ba- basically krampus so it looks yeah, like was, a swedish village or something yeah sweden or iceland uh or norway yeah maybe swedish but yeah that that lodge looks like a maybe a swedish structure and then really really well observed like details again in terms of the way that they live and the the chores that she does um it's amazing how like lived in each of these spaces i don't think it's just the drawing uh though either you know i think it's like a acute sense of uh of minutiae yeah he's like a great 
scene in this where it just spends a really long time with the little girl kind of seeing how foxes are operating in the snow like mm-hmm. how they're, they're walking on their own tracks and and she has snowshoes on and so you're really getting this like tactile feeling of what it's like to be and i guess maybe there's another example of him using weather like it feels really cold and snowy during this whole this whole story and the, and that comes that scene you're talking about comes right after the quote that that sean mentioned which is here and and she's this is like almost a witch in training i guess and they've they've mentioned a few pages prior that there's like this presence that they're both aware of like someone who's passed but is sitting in this chair and then in the training the girl says hey mira why can't i read books and the answer is because you don't have enough experience unless physical experiences and words carry equal weight your spirit won't achieve balance more importantly, now that it's snowed, read the footprints, she said. So that tracking of the wolf is her education in um, learning to read reality. And that's where it really landed for me that like, this is a skill I don't have at all. And then I just happened to go watch a documentary last night uh, that was like an animal documentary. And they've got trackers tracking pumas and stuff. And it was like, man, that is a vocabulary that most of us don't know anymore. And we spend so much time um, just learning to read and consume other people's thoughts. We're basically spending our whole life in other people's heads by reading comics, listening to music, watching movies and stuff, uh, living in architecture and whatnot, that we don't learn to read and communicate with nature. And so she's here learning to read. Uh, just like the the pumas were like in their environment, just reading the environment, and I I thought that was a really powerful message. That like I said, I went I went and like I better practice this, and so I, that's why I slept the way I did. Excellent, yeah, and I like that there's this dog Carl that they introduce and they talk about what his job is. <laughs> yeah, it's... yeah, she's the, the the woman is mad that uh, Carl didn't stop the foxes from uh, killing her chickens. And the girl knows that Carl's actual job is to just stay with her. Uh, so Carl did his job well, you know, from the girl's perspective, because Carl injured one of the foxes and then chased him away and then mm-hmm. stayed with his mistress, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah the, it's the other, uh, one of the other recurring themes in, in the book, I'd say, is the duty, uh, what, who, to whom you have duty to, um, and how do you follow through with those, uh, those duties? And uh, a lot of the the things that we see is like dark magic in their book are basically like violations of that duty. Mm-hmm. The really th- interesting uh, use of kind of overlays on page two eleven, like I think a couple back from where you're at, where where she's looking at the fox and you see her her eye. I think that's a really that that feels kind of like film to me. Yeah, and it's it's that sense of like not just absorption but connection right that there's you're so absorbed in the environment and i think there's another image in here where they show that like the environment swelling up into the body um i don't know if that's in this story or the next one but there's there's a scene where like the whole environment she opens her senses up oh it's in the next one yeah um so that that idea of absorption to the point of um, becoming one with the environment is really important throughout and I think that's where you get like scenes like this, Brandon, where you're talking about that sense of place and at it's almost like a the Manet haystacks, where you're just like he's he's you can tell like exactly the day he's out there painting those or Monet, sorry, uh, the Monet haystacks and the uh, am I saying Sean? Correct me, Manet or Monet? It's Monet does the haystacks in the cathedral. Yes, that would be Monet. Monet. <laughs> It's, man, it's that man, similar man. sense of atmosphere. Exactly, yeah. Um, no, totally. Um, at, at this this is a, a nice little spread there and a nice demonstration uh, that I, not not to be the nerdy guy who's who's uh, talking about the the paper and everything, but I, I wanted to give a little shout out to this heavy newsprint that they found uh, for this. Uh, which, which is, it, it, you know, I, I'm always like Mr. Paper Guy and like, you know, Mr. Reproduction and everything. But I actually really like uh, this because it goes fairly well with the rest of the package. I'm not crazy about the cover, um, but uh, the 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 
paper itself is really, really like earthy <laughs> feeling, you know, um, it's a nice, like, uh, you know, I don't know. What, what, what did you think of that? Having that slight gray does lend to the atmospherics of it. Usually I'm a bit bummed when the manga is not on like a nice bright white paper. Like a lot of it is kind of like, hmm, this art will really pop. But I think like a scene like this, yeah, it's it's atmospherics, really. It's it's weird because it always like bothers me a little bit because it squashes the tonal range, you know, because you don't get the rich black and you don't have a white at all. Um, yeah. On the other hand, like, who the hell cares? Like it's got, you know, if it feels, yeah, I, I, I'm just, I, I, I don't know. I could, I could see both, uh, both sides of it, but. Uh, yeah, I, I think Hiroshi is stuff so subtle that it almost adds to the subtlety that there's nothing really like popping out, like the blacks and the whites, nothing is like that solid black or solid white right so, yeah yeah because like on a foggy day like that that sun might be super bright white on all that snow but i don't know yeah that limited range does contribute i think it's probably just a practical a lot of these mangas are printed on this like kind of trash paper but um in this case yeah it does work really well yeah something else that i noticed about his style is he's he's really feels like uniquely good at doing extreme close-ups and really far away things um i feel like a lot of artists have their sweet spot you know the people who do like mid-range drawings but like he can get right in someone's eyeball and the character looks the same as they do when they're really far away and just like a you know like uh Herge, the artist of tintin that i'm obsessed with he right. he almost i think he never does close-ups of faces because I think right. he realizes that his stuff is so cartoony that it starts to get weird if you saw like Tintin's right. eyelashes. <laughs> yeah, I I know we've talked about this exact thing before because I remember telling you that the Frank King who did Gasoline Alley, I think those are incredible designs, but he, 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 they are close up averse uh, because he either has to choose like, am I going to make it actually look like what it would look like if I drew this up close? And in which case, Ski Six looks like a horrible abomination. Uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, or am I going to like pile on a bunch of detail and make it look like a different character, which of course he doesn't do. Uh, so, you know, the first couple years of Gasoline Alley, he'll throw in like a close up or two, like toddler ski six and so horrible. You could just tell he was like, well, shit, if I didn't have to make a deadline, I would throw that one out. <laughs> Take these pages out to the shed and burn them. <laughs> exactly. Martha. Yeah. I was Time to destroy talk. ski six close ups. <laughs> I tried about, again. Uh, about people's pores in this. Like there's a, there's scenes where someone will walk in an uncomfortable environment and they're like, I feel like my pores are full of wax. And I think mm -hmm. if you have the, like a Naruto drawing or something, it's like if someone doesn't have nostrils, they probably don't have pores. So I think his style really lends to bringing that up, you know? <laughs> and it allows it, him to move in and out of like the manga tropes, you know, like the characters can have the big eyes, especially the women or if they're far away, but then when he moves up close, like it, that sketchiness of it allows him to go in and do a more realistic, you know, slightly exaggerated, but more realistic, or he can switch into uh, like this character here, you know, just there. You, if you saw that in isolation, you would have no indication that that was a manga drawing or not. So he's really able to slip back and forth between the cartooning and the realism, I think because of the looseness of his style uh, at, at a distance, those things can read both as cartoony and realistic. And it really, yeah, gives him that flexibility. That's an interesting observation. Yeah, like the looseness of the line kind of enables a, a different level of uh, hierarchy that can happen in the rendering. Um, and you kind of add that into some of the flexibility. I really like the drawings where he just lets loose and lets like a building look like it's about to topple over and stuff. Um, yeah. You know, he, he he doesn't, he's not a, he's not slavishly copying mo most of the time, you know? Um, and well, so you do- I think we're, we're hitting the scene where the buildings all start to, like all the, the non-living things start to come alive in the story. Right. <laughs> yeah so on this one for context there's an astronaut that gets blasted in the head by a meteorite uh and then that comes back and they're they're kind of talking about evolution and it's almost like a panspermia idea but not quite it's more like a chemical interaction that like a meteor kicked off because they're talking about yeast 
and like the 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 witch ladies are talking about yeast and the thing that causes the reaction that causes it to turn into alcohol and then the stone is kind of like the starter for, for the yeast and the evolution but for some reason this one starts evolving like uh, artificial things it doesn't touch the natural things but it starts getting the buildings and the cars and stuff yeah and something i liked a lot about it is it talks about how they almost immediately die because they didn't have the because if you make a you know if you make a street sign into a living thing it doesn't really have what it needs to stay alive so it just dies and then the <laughs> city starts to rot yeah and again and, and, that and... go ahead sean well, the, the repetition of the visual um, makes me wonder if this isn't part of his artistic, like visual concerns, like primarily visual concerns, because the buildings coming alive and, you know, being occupied by this sort of, you know, in, in, invading microcosm is not dissimilar to the fourth story where people are cursed, you know, like the old woman is killed by the witch by turning into a, like a bag of rats, basically. Mm -hmm. um, there's something it's not like a horror it doesn't seem like a horror trope it seems like a personal archetype that he's trying to address something about the the sort of unnerving feeling that you get when you realize that you're you're individually made up of constituent elements that might have their own concerns you know and that's part of his overriding philosophy about like literally being absorbed in nature that's in the fourth story too where she's there's no boundaries it's just like i'm atomic particles interacting with the other atomic particles you know and the boundaries between those things are are a bit um fake and then here actually in this story he says it as well your world is finite uh, or it, from your point of view i'm a person who connects two worlds the word uh, world of words and the world without your world is finite ours is infinite your words are a knife that cut all possibilities into specific natures, a tool that carves the world at your convenience. We see the world as it is. Uh, and I mean, that's that's a like pretty standard, I think, kind of postmodern critique of language is that it carves everything up into categories and creates division. And he seems very aligned with that, but from a intuitive standpoint, rather than like someone who's read a whole bunch, I think. Obviously, reading would be <laughs> that's the problem of stating those things in words. Hey, uh, Brandon, we, we've talked before about um, the uh, Tokyo Pop uh, artist. I'm trying to remember her name. Uh, she was she she made like a bunch of romance um, books. Erika Shirazawa. Uh, yeah. Uh, do, do you see any similarity uh, stylistically here in terms of the stylization of the characters? And such. Oh, definitely in the characters and also the connection to reality that feels like artists, both both of them feel like artists that are making that are making comic books about life and not comic books about comic books. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is funny how unique that feels that we're, you know, because it's like <laughs> like even my work I feel like is like I'm trying to write about life, but I'm using comic book tools. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm often impressed by looking at this and Erica Shirazawa stuff where where they're able to strip out certain things. Like if there's there's pages in here and the whole scenes in here where he's not, he's able to make things more more interesting and exciting because he's willing to to not do anything flashy. You know, like if he has a, a page turning entire black because it's being filled up by birds, you know, imagine like a Todd McFarlane artist would have a really hard time not drawing like the eyeballs of the birds and like their beaks and all the all the fun <laughs> things that you think of would would bring it in. But he's like looking at it more like if you were there what you would actually see as opposed to embellishing what you think you'd see right and and yeah that, that, that's interesting so there's the thematic and the visual connection between um the two of them but yeah erica shirozawa like um you know someone's emotionally devastated and you might just have four lines making up you know the line of her leg and her foot um on the carpet or whatever you know there's not a lot of like lingering on something until it matters right yeah, yeah. This may, this makes me want to also read with you guys that uh, North by Northwest manga, that is a uh, a manga about a kind of slightly magical family that all lives in um, in uh, I think they're in Norway. Hmm. Uh, it's my my favorite new thing that's coming out lately, and it has a yeah, it's has a very long title, but the first half of it is North by Northwest. <laughs> I'll have to check that out. I think I saw you posting videos about that. 
Yeah. And the the way he draws the faces here, like this this woman's face on the right, where it's it looks like he's taking a more stylized version of something and and dragging it closer to reality. Like I always felt like Frank Quiley's art style looked like if he was if Jack Kirby characters were real and he showed up and did a life drawing of them, like what they would look like. And this has something similar with that. But I I guess the source material might be like the the kind of Celtic stuff that he's drawing at the beginning of the book. But right. also in that international, this reminds me a lot of actually some of those Frank quietly, the people that came after him, like Raphael Grandpa mm -hmm. and um, Ian Bertram. Uh, who's that other guy? Uh, I'm going to forget his name. There's there's another artist that kind of has that style as well. Right, probably uh, Chris, Chris Burnham, I think, is a very quiet Chris guy. Burnham and uh, Ramon Villalobos is the other guy I was thinking of. This this has especially Ian Bertram I can see in this one, but yeah, all those guys out of the Frank Quietly, and Frank Quietly has that same like almost you can't tell if it's done with pen or pencil, very thin lines. It almost looks like he's not doing detail, but there's a lot of detail in there because he's really good at leaving open space, like an image but like this. The the fact that you guys are telling me that it's ballpoint pen, I mean, makes so much sense, and it also kind of makes me feel like maybe. Um, that might be a really fruitful avenue of exploration, you know, even though I've been obsessed with line work all this time, like just because you draw it in a in, in a method that's not necessarily always conducive or thought about as a line work medium doesn't mean you can't reproduce it that way afterwards. Um, you know, I mean, Nauska is famously done in pencil and then shot mm. as if it's ink. Uh, you know, if you could do that in 1983. Uh, we, you know, obviously it would be a snap uh, comparatively today, you know? Yeah. And it allows for like that freshness of just going for it. Like you've got the pen and you're not worried about anything else. Um, I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to watch the Monbin episode. Yeah. But he does draw like, he draws like no individual line is that important, which is maddening <laughs> to me because I am so obsessed with doing a, perfect beautiful line and keeping it like that's like let's not mess with that line don't yeah well it, it, it's it's crazy because uh th this week uh we should say uh so moonray um uh, brandon's new book uh has come out uh in comic stores so it'll be out in bookstores next week and uh you know came out from little line and uh brandon had uh i i shipped out all of the originals that people bought as part of our campaign uh i, I actually sent them out in the past two days uh, because they were lost in the mail for three weeks. <laughs> oh, Jesus. That's frightening. <laughs> well, but I had never seen any of Brandon's originals before, other than the sketches that we did, or that he, uh, he did as part of the campaign. And so seeing your originals, it's like it's the polar opposite of, of this <laughs> book. <laughs> I mean, he, obviously people have individual temperaments and individual drives. Like, would you... Brandon, if you made a page that looked like this, I mean, obviously you'd be satisfied on some level because you like how this looks, but would you, the part of you that makes you do the thing that you do, would that be satisfied by this? I think, I mean, even just in Moonray, Moonray is kind of changing my my metric of what what is satisfying in drawing. Because I mean, something as simple as the characters don't have faces in Moonray and a lot of, right. you know, a lot of... Um, things that I kind of took, like, I feel like a lot of my style was based off drawing faces three quarters to the left kind of anime style, you know? And mm -hmm. if you, and so I keep it like throughout my career, I always have like robot characters or whatever without faces. So to have Moonray where no one has a face and it's just, it's all the shapes of their bodies and everything is kind of a removal from this. So I feel like if I could adapt some of, um, some of uh, Igarashi's style into my stuff, it would, it would just be a benefit. So yeah, my hope is to eat this book and and get a bunch from it. <laughs> right. it hopefully, when you eat it, we can get a close up of your teeth. Uh, uh, yeah. Why? Uh, with you just shove, shoving the book directly in your teeth. Uh, we we are going to have to look at page fifty nine at some point, uh, Carson, because you did pass right over um, the the witch eating the lamb's head and saying they had to be made cognizant of just how insignificant they are. While shoving a uh, lamb eyeballs into her mouth, <laughs> I was also yeah, really impressed a... on the previous page. She has this liquor that is uh, transparent, but then when you add when you cut it with water, it turns gray. And there's a thickness to the way the liquid is drawn that I was really impressed by. 
Yeah, the like the the sort of like uh, expansive quality of it as it's dribbling down, right? It's not like a stream. Yeah, how it like what a crazy observation that page is the fifty seven. Sorry, Carson, we're we're. Uh, <laughs> I've got it. Backwards there. No, yeah, no, the no, cross hatching on that page really, I think, really shows how small these are probably drawn. Right. Yeah, I'll be actually be curious when we look at the Monban. Is he drawing twice the size and shrinking it, or is he just doing it at size? Looks like he's probably drawn a little bigger. But yeah, but even the way the water's like hugging the lip there mm -hmm. and then yeah. falling over and then blobbing a little bit. It's not just one stream. Yeah. Anyways, back uh, to here. Uh another thing I, I, that I, I wanted did, to mention. Every single scene that somebody is eating, uh, unless it's the young witch at the very beginning, is disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. <laughs> the young witch who barely eats anything. Uh, she's the one who doesn't get depicted like a horrible monster <laughs> consuming everything in her path. Okay, Maybe I'm sorry, he just Carson. doesn't eat. Maybe he only drinks. <laughs> He's a breather. Especially by eating. Uh, no, we, we can skip over it. Um, Here's here's one that you get a sense of this. I, I've seen his covers for the Children of the Sea, and so I know how beautiful his watercolors are. This one actually really works in black and white as well, but it's a real shame because you know with color, uh, all that kind of loose observational quality that's in his, his pen and ink work carries over to how he treats watercolor. Uh, the way all these ripples and stuff are going along her feet here, the shadow and everything. It's just a gorgeous piece. And you're like, ah, I want to see it in color so bad. But here we're headed into the fourth major story. And I think this one is the biggest summation of his point of absorption, because that's literally kind of the plot of this one where this character's bored and, and uh, goes on a boat trip with a friend of hers, a boyfriend, and um, meets a Man, witch no gal. She a bunch of money to go on a boat trip and to kind of doesn't know where she's going. Yeah, the, the kind of just restless, right? Like, I just got some money and let's do something. Yeah. And on the boat meets this witch gal who starts telling her how to be in touch with nature, has her take her shoes off and has her feel the wind. And she starts realizing like, oh, it's touching my entire body. And, and then they send her to this page. island where she can be absorbed as well. Yeah, uh, you skip past it, but that panel where it's all the hands over her, like her body's just covered in drawings of hands, and it's meant to represent the wind is a really cool visual way to show a feeling. Yeah, right there on the top left. And she's talking about the sensuality of the wind. Like when you pay attention and you actually pay attention to the wind going over your body, like you're being touched by nature at all points, right? And it, yeah, it is a great visual. And I think this is the one that later has kind of all of everything flowing up into her uh, while she's standing there. There was also this where I thought it's a really great lesson for artists, especially as we're sitting here praising his uh, ability to render atmosphere and like the sense of presence. He has this character say, rhythm was originally an ancient Greek word. It describes the movement of the stuff that makes up the world like atoms. Atoms are the building blocks of life. That's why there's rhythm in everything, in dogs, people, cherry blossoms, carrots, blah, blah, even plastic. They've all got unique rhythms. Even when you look at a picture or a painting, there's a poetic feeling, right? You're probably unconsciously feeling its rhythm. And I, I think that's a really, really important lesson for artists is to expand our sense of both musical rhythm into visual rhythm and then visual rhythm into just those life rhythms, whether they be seasons or days or the wind coming against you. And I think that's why he's able to get that in his paintings because he is feeling in, or in his drawings. I mean, he's like feeling and sensing those rhythms and embedding them in his art. And I think that's part of the reason why we feel so much like we're there when we're looking at his stuff and he's been able to put it into words. It, it's wild that he's been doing this for 20 years. Uh, this is this collection it was in Japanese it was 2004. Uh, I feel mm -hmm. like he's one of those people that, you know, even people doing stuff right now, like contemporary, you know, market are not necessarily always represented in English. We sort of think about it as if, Lots and lots of stuff gets translated now, but um, it's interesting that somebody that can have such a distinctive look and distinctive like philo philosophy <laughs> is not, you know, did, did, this didn't come out until last year.
and only other ha has one other series that's translated right so like what else has he done that we don't know about like why do we not have a complete why do we have the full junji ito and shuzo oshima but not this guy right like I, I don't know i don't get it i feel like i don't know if this is accurate but part of me feels like the the larger conversation about manga is always leans much much younger like the manga that's really yeah. blowing is the stuff that teenager is made for teenagers and so when you have things that are that are essentially comics for adults you know like like walking man we talk about constantly but um i, I don't really see it talked about generally you know yeah yeah and it's being translated yeah. by like a french company Oh, Mon, right. and then they're doing some English translations of it. But yeah, his stuff is is so amazing. And this, I, I think Seven Seas is doing a pretty good job. I think a lot of their stuff is just kind of pornographic from what I've seen. But um, yeah, every now and then they have stuff like this that's of... really stellar. Yeah. Um, We're not knocking pornography, by the way. Uh, no, not at all. Everything to its own shelves, as I say. <laughs> yeah, and maybe that's, maybe that's what allows them to do more thoughtful uh kind of adult comics as they're doing adult comics so it's like their their audience is like oh this you know this sexy centaur just you know joined a brothel and like we'll buy this yeah i'll try out the thing where the guy's like just connecting with the wind as well you know yeah <laughs> and this is i think this spread here is that best one about connecting with the wind and brandon you talking about his ability to represent weather uh Incredible. just astonishing and they just you know you know I, I i've been thinking a lot about the the personal reasons that somebody makes uh art and uh you know we, we talk about graphomania and I, I it's just interesting to me that there's just a set of things that can satisfy that itch inside of us um i was interested brandon to hear that you, you know you feel like you can kind of substitute one for the other that like you know you could change up your 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 desires or your workflow and still satisfy it because uh, I was it, it always seems to me like we get kind of shaped in a certain kind of way um, and that's the the shape that drives us you know from from then on and obviously this guy has a huge set of concerns but also like sort of visual touch points of things that are going to satisfy him as being a complete image sure. and those things are really unique you know to him. Yeah, and they're really, cohesive. Right, that as well. Yeah, and it, it opens up kind of, it definitely opens up the possibility of what you can do with comics when you see stuff like this. Right. Because he touches on some trope stuff slightly, but it's so, it just doesn't feel anchored in that. Yeah. It really, yeah, it really, and, and that's, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say it, it just, it, it feels like he's trying to be a person and make art about a person and not at all like you know it's 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 a comic book by someone who maybe has never played street fighter you know it's really nice yeah <laughs> well and that's where that cohesion like you have someone who's really got a core interest and that shows up in the stories it shows up in his approach to art it shows up in the thematics it shows up in the dialogue that he writes and i think that's what like i've always had a hard time um I've always had a hard time dealing with humans. Like mm -hmm. when when you're dealing with someone and they're just a human, they're kind of just acting the way humans act and stuff. But then there's that moment where you find out what they're interested in. Or if you're lucky, you find out who they are and they become a person, sure. you know? And uh, this is very much, yeah, like I know the person and it's it's coming through the art. He has a particular thing that obsesses him uh and and yeah a lot of stuff just feels rote and this does not at all yeah it's really i was kept saying the last story is my favorite then the last story is just a quick little witch story about a woman a little girl loses her cat but um but yeah this story where it just it's interesting because the so so the basic idea is the little girl like there's a teenage girl who steals money from her school and and is able to go out adventuring and while she's adventuring she meets the witch and hears about this this special magical island that she's not allowed to take anything from she goes to and and there's this implication that she'll be reborn when she goes there and he shows this rebirth by her like 
essentially becoming nature here where like the 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 rain kind of starts to ripple in her body and then like animals like she has all these fish like go up her leg and then and then she kind of becomes water full of full of life here like like that that yeah um and then she's like really worried about leaving this island because she's gonna she's gonna just go back to all of her doubts and and shitty normal high school life and so she she breaks the one rule where she wasn't allowed to take anything from Ireland, but she takes a seashell so she can listen to the island when she's gone. Hmm. And then it just yeah, talks she... about how the island is, is going to come for her and kill her, and it's not really important past that. <laughs> but it's it's that like she goes from being a person, being an individual, to just being one with everything, right? Complete absorption into nature <laughs> has like the ego death experience. And then I think that like taking the seashell with you is like you you're not supposed to be able to bring back the wisdom from the epiphany like it's supposed to be impossible. And the the desire for that is kind of a naughty thing. Like when you come back and you are yourself again and you're trapped within the boundaries of your perceptions, uh, you can't really communicate that ecstatic one experience and and you're doing something wrong diminishing it by bringing it back with you and that even he's suggesting i think there's negative negative consequences to even trying which is strange because the stories all seem to be an attempt to point you at it. it there's a there's a quote i was told once i think it's from a bruce lee movie but i was told it in an art critique um a professor told me point at the moon without your finger getting in the way and oh, i feel like that's what this book is trying the, to do at least the bruce lee quote is the is bruce lee points at the moon and a and a kid he's training looks at his hand and he slaps him and he says if you're focused on the hand you'll miss all this heavenly glory yeah <laughs> I, I put that in <laughs> yeah uh, um, also i wanted to point out the the buddhist monk how he orders a hot dog <laughs> where was he i don't remember that everything. scene in this book no this is a, a bad joke i remember because oh said okay um, the man from nantucket you guys familiar with him <laughs> <laughs> look i really need somebody to tell me the rest of the rhyme okay <laughs> i know it's either bucket or fuck it <laughs> i believe it's suck it is what where Sean's <laughs> going with this. you missed it completely carson uh, well, uh, fantastic book from Seven Seas. Uh, I, I want to point out to you all that this is the shortest conversation that Brandon and Carson and I have ever had together. Uh, we 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 hear your words. We we want to to meet you where you are in your individual time here, and we 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 do our best to deliver. We're trying, <laughs> and Sean's got to go. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. I do have to go. Uh, but I hope everybody will read this. And I also hope that everybody else will read two very, very Halloween appropriate books. And that is this, The uh, Abolition of Man by Carson Grubaugh, which is a truly nasty book um, about the truly nasty future. And um, Moonray Book One uh, by Brandon Graham, which is a truly cheery book about the truly nasty, truly nasty future. Uh, I actually think that they complement each other quite well. Uh, and if you've read both of them, I'd be very curious to hear uh, it, uh, who's winning in your brain. <laughs> yeah, me, me or Brandon, whose future do you think, think is both, coming? I but, mean, they could be the same timeline because mine is post-human and yours like, how bad is this going to get? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the abolition of man is what leads to the world of moon ray potentially uh and brandon i want to i want to have a conversation with you about that at some point in time anyways we'll leave it hanging with that but sean do you have another halloween announcement you want to make oh no i can't do it yet because uh, i okay. think this video is done before tuesday yeah so i can't i can't do it but we'll have an announcement on tuesday about a very special something um i'm just i don't even know if i can tell you anything uh, it's a historic manga. Let's say that. Okay. Okay. Uh, got it. Got, got a historic manga announcement that can happen on Tuesday. Follow us on Instagram. Uh, you know, check your email, get on our email list and uh, we will update you with that. But uh, yeah. That's in the meanwhile, what's that? 
you announced an announcement. So I think that counts. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you get yeah. extra hype, right? You're like, coming Tuesday, something really exciting. Yeah. You'll have to wait, wait and wonder. <laughs> I've taken notes of the Beatles. They've been talking about how they're going to have a, a new single for about eight months now. So, uh, you know, wait till next week, boys. <laughs> we don't need it. No one cares. The Beatles. <laughs> the Beatles are they back together? Did they did they resurrect a couple of those guys? That's gonna <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I have to say I really like the Patrick Nagel uh that you've got on your wall now, Brandon. Uh I've been admiring it the oh, entire it time. A it's a it's a blondie. Um Casey Jones uh is a is a very big Debbie Harry fan. So they have a blondie. I, over here I've got a Barba Papa. Ah. got that in amsterdam because my friend didn't like it <laughs> and i love it so this is a the, i'm sorry this is a blondie poster in the style of nagel i think it's just a blown oh. out yeah it's just a blown out um photograph uh -huh. it is very nagel it's funny the neighborhood because i'm living in los angeles now and the neighborhood i'm in has so many patrick nagel uh nail <laughs> salons in it that i really yeah. like like in the barber salons yeah yeah and they have just like the um, yeah, the Patrick Nagel kind of, you know, he died aerobicizing. <laughs> no, I didn't, but that was <laughs> 1980s. So well. Patrick Nagel waited, <laughs> died covering <laughs> cocaine aerobicizing. You know what the best thing about Patrick Nagel is, besides the fact that I really like his work on actually, is that like the colors he used were made to be put in windows where they were going to get a shitload of sunlight and bleach out the colors, and it still looks like his art. <laughs> Oh, they did that on purpose. That's it's brilliant. Genius, isn't it? That is cool. Huh. That is wild. And You're absolutely was... right. Yeah, all the light shifted posters in every every uh, thrift store in Los Angeles and San Diego. All of them, all of them only have a uh, blue and a little bit of yellow left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and like I mean, that's what his art looks like from the jump. Time, time makes Nagel of us all. Make sure to like, smash that subscribe button, and ring that bell.